Hey, we're diving into Nourish Your Biblical Roots Podcast. Shalom from here in the Holy Land. Welcome to the Nourish Your Biblical Roots Podcast. I'm your host, L. Epstein, President and CEO of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. Each week, we'll explore the Jewish roots of your Christian faith and nourish those roots with inspirational insights and ancient teachings that are so relevant to our lives today. Let's get started. On today's podcast, we're going to explore a teaching about knowing our true value and why it's so important that we do. If you've ever doubted your worth, or if you've ever wondered if you can be the person that changes the world for the better, then this message is for you. This is a teaching that I'm going to share with you that literally influences how I live every day of my life and every decision I make. God gives Moses a command to count the Israelites. I'm going to read you the verse, which you can find in Exodus 30, 11 to 12. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, When you take a census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord ransom for his life at the time he is counted. Then no plague will come on them when you number them. Now, let me stop right here and say this is the translation of the Bible verse. The original, obviously, is in Hebrew. And when you know Hebrew, you read the Bible in a really different way. I remember when I first moved to Israel and I had to learn Hebrew, it was around 16 years ago, suddenly all the words that I would hear, I connected back to the Bible, which is so cool. One of the first things that I learned in Hebrew was the days of the week. And I grew up in America where we have Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. But in Israel, we literally call the days of the week the same thing that they're called in the Bible. Yom Rishon, the first day in the story of creation. Yom Sheni, the second day. Yom Shlishi, the third day. All the way leading up to what in English we call Saturday. But in Hebrew, the only word for the day is Shabbat, the Sabbath. And so there's something very, very deep about studying the scriptures in Hebrew. You can come away with a whole new understanding. And so there are a few ways, actually, to understand the name of this week's Parsha. Kitisa that we just found in that verse. On one hand, it can be translated as when you take a census, but in Hebrew, kitisa can also mean when you raise up. And very often in Hebrew, when a word has two different meanings, they're connected. And so now let's read that Bible verse again. It says, When the Lord said to Moses, When you raise up, up the Israelites and count them. Each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life. And so we learn from this when Moses counted the people, when he was instructed directly from God to count every single one of the Israelites. What was the intention there of counting them? It was intended to raise their sense of self-worth to realize how precious they are in God's eyes. Now, we all know that there's a real risk in taking a census. On one hand, it can accomplish exactly what we said of how kitisa can be translated, to rise up, to show that they're counted. And on the other hand, it has the potential to do the worst destruction and to completely dehumanize someone and diminish their value when we're taking a census, when we're counting someone. You see, I'm the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor, and my father-in-law is a Holocaust survivor. And I grew up knowing many, many people with numbers on their arms from the Holocaust, from the concentration camps. And what the Nazis did during the Holocaust was they counted everybody, but it wasn't in order to raise them up. It was in order to diminish them, to become a number, to become useless. You don't even have a name. You simply have a number. But what we're learning here is what God wanted to do through this counting 
was the opposite. He wanted us to feel uplifted, not diminished when counted. And so Moses' job when counting the people was to teach them how much they truly count and how much God values each one of us. So just like we spoke about there's way of counting, and that is in order to take away the identity, take away any sort of worth, right? Like we spoke about in the Holocaust. There's another one. You can count something that's precious to you, that you sit there counting all day. An example of this in modern times might be uh, counting money. That if somebody has a job that they've been waiting for and that they've been working so hard for and they finally get paid, wow, they count that money over and over because it's such a relief. It's so precious to them that they're finally able to get the money that they've been praying for, that they count every dollar because every dollar counts. Or like the sheep pass through Meron. So on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, tradition teaches that God judges every living creature. And in our liturgy, this is depicted in a very vivid manner. We say, all mankind will come before you like sheep in Meron. Now, you have to ask, what's Meron? But Meron is actually a mountain not too far from where I am here in Israel, in the Galilee, that's shaped like an M. And what that means is that anyone or any animal who wants to pass can only do so one at a time through the narrow middle. And this is how God looks at every single individual. He looks at every single individual one at a time. And so according to Jewish tradition, each person has to recognize that they are precious in God's eyes. They are precious in God's eyes and there is no one else like them. That they have to actually say, there's a verse in Hebrew that we say, The whole world was created just for me. And there are so many ways to understand this. It's really connected of doing the counting, of taking the census. That God is saying, The whole world was created for you. And there are so many ways to understand what that means. What does it mean that the whole world was created for me? Okay, we know that God loves me, that I'm individual. But maybe we can look at it like God loves me like an only child. Well, I could relate to that as a mother of four. I remember every time that I've been pregnant making sure that my older children knew that the pregnancy would not take anything away from how much I love them. Especially after the baby was born and the baby took so much attention and I made sure that my older children got even more attention than before. Because It's understandable. An older child could feel, ah, there's somebody new in the world now. There's somebody new in our family now that my parent loves, that my mother loves. Now she might love this baby even more than me because how can she love us both so much? But being a mother, I know that with each baby who came into the world, my heart grew. It didn't take away from the love I felt for my older children, but my love only grew. Every child I love like an only child. And so I think this verse is also telling us that we are one in seven billion people here on earth that we could start to think, "Mm, what value am I to God in this world? But what we are being taught here by Moses taking the census and by this verse of the whole world was created just for me, is that to God, we are the only one in this world like us. We have a special mission here in this world. And every single one of the 7 billion people in this world are a child to God that is like an only child. And therefore, what I do in this world has enormous significance. 
I matter and my actions matter. Have you ever wondered if what you do, especially when no one else is looking, makes a difference in the world? Have you ever felt like, who am I that my actions actually matter? Or that my words actually matter? Or God forbid, have you ever thought, who am I that my prayers even actually mattered? What difference does it make in the world? Well, there's a Jewish analogy that we always think about and talk about and imagine and it inspires us and I tell my children that the world is like a scale and when we come into this world that scale is even on one side there are bad deeds the sins and on the other side there are the good deeds the mitzvot all the good things that we're doing and you know that our actions can tip that scale one way or the other I know that. I know that every action I take, whether it's in public or whether it's in private, is tipping that scale. And that encourages me and inspires me that I matter. My actions matter. My thoughts matter. My words matter. And I want to do good. I want to do good not only in man's eyes, but in God's eyes, because God is always watching and I need to always make good decisions. But as we study these things of I matter, I matter, the whole world was created for me, sometimes I stop and think, okay, but I am not supposed to have an ego. I am not supposed to use these verses to have an ego and think that I'm better than anyone else, God forbid. And so there has to be a balance. And that's when the verse that Abraham specifically said himself in Genesis 18.27 comes into play. Afar ve'efer anochi, we say in Hebrew, I am but the dust and ashes. I am but dust and ashes. And what we're saying here is although we remember that God created us because we're needed, And there's no one else like us in the world that can take our place. And God loves us exactly as we are and cares about who we are. What we're also saying is I am but dust and ashes. God is the creator, not me. I'm not in charge. I came from dust and I will return to dust. In fact, there's a famous story of a rabbi. His name is Rav Simcha Bunim. And he used to have a paper in each pocket that every day he would go around with two pieces of paper. In one pocket, he kept a paper that said, the whole world was created just for me. And in the other pocket, he kept a paper that said, I am but dust and ashes. The rabbi kept both of these quotes with him to remind him that both perspectives are essential and that we need to hold them in balance. We need to be humble, but not too humble that we don't recognize our value and ability. We need to know that we matter and that we are here to make a difference, but we can never become overly arrogant. We need to realize that God has his plan and he will carry it out with or without us. Yet at the same time, we need to know that God expects us to do what we can to make a difference for the better in this world. My father always would say, you do your best and you let God do the rest. And this is something that for me really sums up all of these different concepts. It's a concept that I hold dear in my heart and really inspires, encourages, gives me a guiding light for everything I do in my life. That I have to know what my role is, that I want to contribute that I want to build, I don't want to destroy, that I want to bring light, I don't want to spread darkness. And in everything I do, it makes me realize that I have to be my unique self. I could only contribute to the world if I'm doing it in an authentic way that only I can contribute. And so I think about work. 
that for 15 years I worked at the fellowship and I did everything from working in the mailroom. I started off by putting uh, stamps on envelopes and I moved my way up and I, I was in almost every position in the fellowship in those 15 years until upon my father's sudden passing two years ago, I became the president and CEO of this huge organization. And what I realized Exactly my strengths come from this teaching. First of all, that I am just a messenger of God, that I must be obedient to Him. And by being, being obedient to Him, I'm recognizing that He has a purpose for my life and that I can achieve anything if I tap into Him. And yet I realized also that I, I'm not God. I come from dust and I will return to dust. I have to do what only I uniquely can do and trust other people to do what they uniquely can do. And so as I became president and CEO, instead of trying to micromanage every part of the organization, instead of going back and getting details on every single uh, department that I was working in in the past 15 years and saying, I know best, I know best, I know best, no. I set out different goals for myself as president and CEO that only I can do. And I made it a philosophy and a practice to encourage, to strengthen, and to trust others in the organization to do what only they can do. And through that philosophy, we just ended with the strongest year the fellowship has ever had before. And so I guess the way that I would internalize this is that God created the world just for me and he created the world just for you and everyone. Everyone matters and we need to treat each other accordingly. And so I want to read that verse again for you from Exodus 30, 11 to 12. Let's see if we understand it differently now. Then the Lord said to Moses, When you raise up the Israelites and count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life. Wow, how beautiful. God is counting each one of us because each one of our lives really matter. And so, my friends, the ultimate lesson, I think, to sum it up is from Leviticus 19.18, that we all know very well to love your neighbor as yourself. First, love and value yourself. And if you do that correctly, by holding it in balance, that will lead naturally to love and value your neighbor. Shavua Tov, my friends. Have a wonderful week from here in the Holy Land. Thank you for listening to the Nourish Your Biblical Roots podcast. If you like what you have heard, visit me at mybiblicalroots.org for more of my teachings, videos, blogs, and books. You can also follow me on Instagram at yael underscore Eckstein or on Facebook at yael Eckstein. Shalom and see you next week. Let's stop our seatbelts and see how we go with this in five minutes. Everything in here is just things that I, you know, I mean, I'm going to be picky, but then I'm going to be sincere, right? I got to be picky or, you know, what's the sense if I'm not picky? First of all, you know, I want to say, wow, that's so powerful. I mean, when I say powerful, I'm talking about the intensity of your sincerity in a point where you just, you know, open your life and, you know, talk on some things. You know, especially when you started coming to the closing parts, which I'm going to do, which I'm going to do a lot on my response when you start talking about the things that are of a preeminence in your life, you know, when, when it comes to like, you know, building and not destroying, you know, being, being a light and not dark, the 
discovering the unique things of yourself being the mighty empowerment when it comes to the excellence of what the Lord could accomplish even to the point where your greatest year was when you discovered your person in the midst of the vision when it comes to the, the empowerment of God it's almost like when you discover, you know, what the Lord designed you to be, then you became the greatest impact to what he needed you to be. Not be. I don't like saying be, right? Because there's one who's to come that's to be, right? I don't, that's why I got little funny things, right? But I'm saying that that's moving to me. That's, that's intense. And, you know, I know we're public on talking on these things. This is all it's ever been. Public. We're public, right? So, I mean, when I'm talking, I know that there's a lot of people that I, are, are impacted with the same journey. Some who have intense responsibility, intense, uh, uh, um, you know, similar like what you have, you know, thrusted upon them when it comes to, you know, their call to lead. Yeah, you know what's so dynamic? Your love, even for, you know, Reb Ab Eckstein, which really is a strong strength uh, when it comes to your love for the lord even the intensity of your love for your dad because you love him so much and even the fact that you honor your father like that before the lord and, and, and some say well how are you getting that well listen to one of the things you said you know it matters how you live because you always live under the under the inspection of god almighty and your love for him that's really the intensity of a genuine heart that has a true relationship with the living God, right? Okay, so now I'm going to be a bit picky now. Okay, I only have the English translation. You brought some things that were from Hebrew perception when it comes to scriptural, scriptural um, rooting, and I th which I think is so important. If you're going to understand the Word of God, then, you know, we should go through the, through the purity path. The pure language the Lord gave, gives us. But ultimately, you know what I've discovered? Even if you know Hebrew, but you lack a heart that's cut for the Lord. A heart that's cut for the Lord is a heart that so loves God. Not because he commanded, you know, love the Lord God or else. I don't even think that's the true spirit of what the Lord said. I don't think he said, you know, love me or else. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's wrong. People, you know, they read it like that because, you know, the enemy wants to get in there, right? Oh, you better love God or else, you know? Love the Lord your God or else. I don't think that's even in there, <laughs> right? Love the Lord God with all your heart. Well, how? How? How's that possible? How can we possibly love God without Him revealing Himself in some fashion to our heart i mean uh, then it is religious right if we if we love god because you know tradition says or because you know the scriptures say but we don't know the breath of god you know where we kiss his son and even if you haven't yet heard about the messiah already coming the shemesh who is in fact intense when it comes to you know igniting our life to be a light if even if you don't know who jesus is yet Still, there's so many people who discover the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, the blessings of God's heart towards us through loving the Lord. It's loving the Lord. and But how can we possibly love God unless His Spirit is the one who teaches us how to love Him in that degree, right? So, so powerful, the things you said open us up. So first, first I, want to, I want to touch on some doctrinal things, right? Okay, you really brought something to my attention. Now, I'm thinking, is this a modern way? To communicate the days of the week, I think it is in Hebrew. Is that a modern way to say? Because I know anciently, you know, in ancient understandings of scripture, even the Bereshit, we know that, uh, you know, day one is unique from day seven, even as day seven is unique from all the days of the week. Like you said, day seven is Shabbat. Unique. But did you know it's it's through rabbinical discoveries that, we, that we've heard about this? Even in Christ, Christian theological corners, they've discovered it through, you know, the rabbinical um, study of Judaic, you know, understandings of the Bereshit. They let us know day one is Yom Ichad, which is, okay, so second day and first day, right? Is it, what, what, is that how it goes? Is it day one 
and then and then okay how did it go so this is what i got and i'm just saying i'm touching on it but really it's relevant to where we're going in respect to the doctrinal parts before we touch on the sincerity you know can i can you can we do that i want i want to touch on the doctrinal parts first because you brought up scripture you brought up some things in scripture that were that were toning when it came to open us up to looking at different aspects when it comes to numbering the people right or being of the number and then you even brought relevance to in um uh, deuteronomy 30 is that where we were deuteronomy 30 right? or exodus was it exodus 30 i think it's exodus 30 right oh man i should have wrote it down i think it's exodus 30 you brought up i really think it i'm trying I'm trying not to do like a whole hour and a gazillion up in here for your you know 15 20 minute <laughs> And to do like an hour, everybody's like, "Yeah, Sandra," because you know we only listen to the first ten seconds of where you're going. My goodness, and I want to do my best to you know give a good response. So I think it's Exodus thirty, yeah, right? Yes, Exodus thirty eleven and twelve is what you took us to in respect to Moses. And I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some things I see, but I, of course, like you know, I only see it according to the English translation. So you know, I'm hoping that one day we can actually sit down and you know break some bread up in here and actually like i'm doing a response to your general not general i mean it's a sincere message but it it, it was publicly like it's for everybody it's always for everybody right but it's something when you sit down open the word of god and, you know and go back and forth in the word of god like not back and forth as if you're short sharp short sword sharpening but i mean breaking bread is a unique facet of fellowship when it comes to especially when it comes to the strength of you know where the lord brought you into this and how the lord brought me into this when it comes to scriptural understandings and the things that the lord teaches in respect to doctrine so okay for example okay so genesis chapter one verse sheet right chapter one you know when i read it right okay so it says there, okay so we eat okay so here it is so god called the light day in the darkness he called night in the evening and the morning were the first day right now literally the uniqueness of it is it doesn't say first day in the original hebrew um um accounting of verse 5 of bereshit of genesis 1 5 it literally says yamichad or day one and then when it comes to uh, uh verse 8 you know god called the firmament uh, heaven and you know in uh in the evening what is it in the evening in the morning were the second day the second day the third day all the way on to the seventh day um has a unique wording that's similar but it but isn't the same as day one that's why we say you know because you know, day one the lord even the glory he rose okay he rested on the seventh day you know what's so powerful when when the messiah when yeshua jesus when he was on the cross there's a reason why i'm, I'm bringing him up on the cross and i'm talking about the blood he shed the blood he shed which was the ransom the redemption he paid the ransom for our soul right you gotta hear you gotta understand why i'm saying this so he wrote okay so he was put in the earth in the heart of the earth even some say that there's a ball of fire but he was put okay so he descended he freed prisoners that were that were um imprisoned right and he took the power over satan sin sin sickness and disease he 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 paid the wages for our iniquities right he, he paid the wages scriptures all over the place in the tanakh can show you this you know how he was going to do this he paid okay though your sins be like scarlet right he paid the wages for our iniquity he did all these things you know okay someone saying okay will you please help us understand him where is this coming to numbering the people and all these different types of things well first thing i want to do is i want to touch on the doctrinal things right so i never knew that you know when you pronounce in the hebrew you know like sunday i think that's a modernized hebrew um understanding uh, because i think in the script uh, like according to the scriptures you said it's according to the scriptures but is it a translation that is ancient when it comes to what was communicated because i'm pretty sure ancient hebrew in context to verse 5 of genesis 1 says uh day one in the second day in the third day you know it doesn't really say uh, the first day but it literally says day one 
which is unique from the English uh, that we have. I'm pretty sure you got to investigate it. I'm, I'm just saying, I'm pretty sure. Now, what's the rele relevance to all these different things when it comes to the unique, even the uniqueness of how the Lord, you know, institutes this first day, you know, and how, how even day seven is unique, uh, being Shabbat. And how the Lord, even when he died on the cross for our sins, he shed his blood, the Messiah, the Shemesh, how he shed his blood for us. How the Messiah came before he was reigning as king. He came as a suffering servant. He shed his blood for us and he did what only he could do in respect to our desires to be righteous, even according to his Torah. Why? Because we love him so much. That we love him so much that we're so unbalanced. Because as much as we love him, it still doesn't constitute as much as we fall. You know what I thought was so powerful too? He said, you know... You just you, you count it. It's such a blessing how the Lord would, would put so much weight on the actions that you take. Now, if anybody heard that in a, in, a, in a wrong sense where they did not understand the Lord's love and who the Lord is and wanting to please Him, they wouldn't understand the ramifications of what you communicated. But I understand the ramifications of what you're saying is as much as I'm doing everything in the sight of God is as much as he's putting weight on the actions that I take, even when no one's looking. That's so powerful to look at it that way, right? You know, there's actually a scripture in the in the Tanakh, New Testament, I mean, in the Abrit HaDashah, that talks about how we're going to sit before the judgment seat of, of Mashiach. Oh yeah, he's going to be judging his, his church, Jew and Gentile, all of us. And you know what it says? I love Paul, because you know what he says? He says, he says, and then uh, when, uh, he's going to judge us, and, and we're going to hear who's, who's, what does it say? I can't, I don't want to mess it up, but he's like, he, what does he say? Uh, 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 where he says he's going to judge the secret hidden things of man's heart, whose praise will come from God. I thought, wow, how powerful is that? Because, you know, when you think about God judging you, you're thinking, oh, man, you know, you're shaking in your boots, you're in terror here. But Paul puts it as a delight, saying, you know, he's going to judge your secret intentions, the hidden things of your heart, and you're going to get praise from the Holy One. And you're like, wow, Lord, how amazing, right? The thought that, the thought that God weighs our actions, and then through the grace of the Almighty Holy Mashiach, the, the ben, uh, ben Elohim, ben, ben Adam, the Son of God, the Messiah, through His righteous ability to make the scale balance for all eternity, even tipping when it comes to uh, our exceedingly uh, um, great reward based on His ability to be excellent in the eyes of Almighty God, even to the point where, where I'll say Hashem, right? I think because a lot would understand that, you know, where you're coming from. You know, even with, even with the Lord of Glory, you know, uh, uh, you know, Hashem, uh, you know, uh, what is it, Yahweh, they'd say, right, uh, Yehovah, some would say, even with the Lord of Glory, uh, you know, He says to His beloved Son, this is my beloved Son, in, in whom I am well pleased, right? In whom, the Word of God says, this was after the Messiah got baptized by John the Baptist in the water. Not only did he fulfill Old Covenant Torah um, observance, uh, um, what is it, um, the, or, what is it, uh, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, ordinances of the, what is it, the, uh, the righteous requirements of the Torah, the Messiah fulfilled that. But not only there, but he also fulfilled the righteous requirements of the Brit Hadashah blossomed Torah. Do you know that there's a require there's requirements when it comes to having the gospel effective in your life, the actions of Messiah? There's requirements, there's things that God has commanded us to do, even when he blossomed the Torah in the Brit Hadashah, when it comes to faith in what he has done in his death and resurrection for us, there's requirements to truly embracing his love for us and truly from the heart obeying uh, his command to love him the Lord our God right there's, there's requirements when it comes to that what I mean there's there's authenticity to a heart that's really loving God versus someone professing to love God but not really loving God even though that's not the, the, the talk today the talk today is are you of the number <laughs> that's, that's what I want to put in my response are you of the number 
when it comes to the sincerity of what you're conveying today, right? This is my question to those who are listening, possibly. My question is, okay, the, the excellent things that you gave, and I'm going to come to the sincerity of your closing, but I'm, I want to touch on the doctrinal areas first. My question is, you know, based on these dynamic things that you brought up, and, you know, my best, not never to refute, but only encourage, because it's dynamic. Every time I listen, you know, we're all learning here. But, you know, just to compliment, that's, that's all I want to do is compliment what you gave. And so when I look at Exodus 30, okay, there's a few things that I see in respect to the English. I got the English translation. Now, I have an English trans translation that has authority, like the King James, believe it or not. Even though when you measure it up, uh, you know, not against, but when you measure it up towards the original Hebrew, even the ancient original Hebrew, there's many things the English just cannot convey like Hebrew. That's why it's so important that we, but I mean, if you don't have the spirit of the Lord, you know, read Hebrew all day long, you, you, you're not going to get the heart. You know, without the Lord's spirit, so preciously pouring out the love of God in, in our hearts. I mean, you know, even if you don't have faith in new covenant reality, still the spirit of the Lord is at work. You can't tell me you read the Torah, you fear God traditionally, you're in the Orthodox synagogue, and, and God is not uh, present. Of course he is, he's present. But the true and living God is present, and I guarantee you, I, I'm telling you, if any, every synagogue, synagogue, Judaic, has had the opportunity to know Bit, bits and pieces of the gospel in Jesus Yeshua. Although some have misrepresented it, uh, represented scriptures, but some uh, who are of Orthodox uh, Judaism took the initiative to go to the scriptures and read the Brit Hadashah, not with a minded "oh, this is a Gentile book," you know, but with a minded sincerity, going before the Lord, saying, "Okay, Lord." These are the things I'm hearing. And with a minded sincerity, anyone I've ever talked to who's done that, I've all, or, or, or I've heard their testimonies. I've only heard how amazingly moved they were when the Lord began to reveal things. So here, uh, here we are. I'm going to stick to the context of, of doctrinal, then I'm going to come down to closing when it comes to sincerity parts that you broke off at the ending part, uh, the ending part of your uh, message. Uh, which was very powerful today, very moving for some of us intensely. So here we go. Exodus 30, verse 11 and 12. Now, I have some questions I'm going to pose in my response because I'm not so well, you know, I, 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 I'm empowered when it comes to the Hebrew. I mean, I don't even know how to speak it properly. You know, I'm busted out here. You know, I'm, I'm trying to talk like as if I know, like as if I know Yiddish. I don't even know Yiddish. I'm like ghetto busted when it comes to my you know, my language. Even I'm so ghetto busted. I mean, I'm not eloquently, you know, excellent, but you know, but don't get it messed up. I, I do know how to articulate based on what the spirit gives me i know how to speak according to the spirit of the lord enriching you know my tongue my heart because i love him and you know and, and some will catch wind of it so anyway so exodus 30 11 this is my, my best to respond doctrinally and then dive into your closing sincerity parts which are moving here we go exodus 30 11 says and the lord spoke unto moses saying when thou takest the sum now hear this when thou takest the sum, okay, let's read it in, 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 in totality. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, this is Exodus 30, 11 and 12. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord when thou numberest them, and there shall be no plague among them when thou numberest them. Okay, now there's a few things that the Lord has said that brings a righteous investigation when it comes to the mind of God. First of all, why is the Lord talking about a plague when Moses is numbering the people? Okay, this is what this comes to my mind. Okay, Lord, why are you bringing in a plague? Another thing is, the Lord is saying, when you take. Okay, now I know that you brought a Hebrew understanding of that word take us. You brought a Hebrew understanding which built, it, which built the sincerity of where I want to go. In respect to the ransom part. In respect to, okay, you brought in the, the part was the value you brought in, right? How the value was applied when Israel was numbered by Moses. Okay, I'm, I'm getting there because I want to go there because that's that's intensely powerful when it comes to my, my heart to try to sincerely compliment what you gave from a Brit Hadashah aspect when it comes to New Covenant 
things that I know in my heart based on the Lord, a glory revealing, you know, his Yeshua to my heart, you know, and I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart, with sincerity. I love the Lord Jesus so much because I would not know the true God without Messiah who has revealed the true and living God you know, to all of us. We have an understanding, uh, you know, if the Lord was going to help uh, us understand, he would become a man and dwell among us. And that's exactly what he did. And he did it from eternity past. He even had the, he even had the boldness to say to the, the the very strong leadership who were opposing him, even amongst the Judaic community who were opposing him. Not everybody was, but there were some who knew he was the Messiah and envied his position and outrightly opposed him and even misled the people of Israel based on their religious hidden intention, which really reveals Cain. So anyway, the years ago, could you hear how the Lord said things? You know, this is what he said to the to the religious people when he was here in, in the flesh as man amongst us from baby up. He said to them before Abraham was. Listen, okay, wait, you got to build it properly. He said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. And they said to him, you're not even 40, I think they said 40, I think, 40 or 50. You're not even 40 years old. How can you say Abraham, right? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. It picked up stones, righteously so, right? Because either he is the Lord or somebody better stone this guy up in here, right? Because he's saying some stuff that's, he's a Lord. And we know because he came with the, I always bring this up. He came with the two angels to tell Abraham about what he was going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. How did he come? As a man. Before he even came. As a baby born and grew up. And he, he had no place to lay his head. And he, he did the Torah to the T. So our iniquities can be cleansed. But how did he satisfy the wages of, uh, of our sins when we should be uh, eating the dust? But instead he gave us spirit life when we should be eating the dust. He gave us spirit life. How how could he do such a thing? Because he bore the image of the dust and satisfied the curse of the dust by his holiness and shed his blood for us and redeemed us with a ransom. Are you are you numbered? <laughs> Like, that's what I'm thinking. Powerful, right? So, look, so my first thought is, wait a minute. Did the Lord say, Moses, I'm commanding you, go number the people? I don't know because that's not what I see. Now, I'm not reading up verses earlier. I'm just jumping in, right? But what I see is the Lord is saying, okay, when you do this thing, that's sort of what I'm seeing. It's like the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, when you take, what does he say? When you take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, right? So this seems like a decision that Moses uh, was going to partake of. Did, he, did the Lord say number the people? I don't know. Like If there's a verse that says that, maybe that could be messing the whole thing up. But reality, what I see is like Moses was going to number the people. And any time throughout scriptures where there's a numbering of the people, a mustering you know, is usually there. What are the armies of Israel? Let's number them. King David was moved, and it's almost a complexity. You're like, okay, Lord, did you move King David? Cause, you know, and then it, 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 you know, because it talks about how the enemy is. It looks like the Lord actually told him to. But then when you see what comes, even to the point where this angel, because okay, so the Lord says to to, to King David, okay, now you know, you did this thing. Now you're gonna make a decision on your penalty. Right? And, and and like a loving father, so powerful. And King David says, you know, I'd rather fall, you know, into the hands of you, O Lord, than man. Because he gave him like three different options, right? The Lord is mighty. He said, you're going to get a penalty for your actions of numbering the people. Because, you know, and then uh, he was like, now here's your decision. You can have this, this or that. And uh, one of the options were, you know, to for the Lord to, to bring about his judgment. So King David was like, you know, I'd rather fall into your hands, Lord, you know. So then the Lord sends the angel. He stretches out his sword across, uh, I think it was over Jerusalem, right? And all these people start dying and all this stuff is going plague up in here, everything. And the Lord himself, almost like you could see, like he stretched out his hand and said, stop. And I'm like, wow, God, this angel's like frozen in the heaven <laughs> with his sword. You know, it's an intense moment. You can see the love of God. 
just stretched out and i, I was like wow what, what a moment so anyway here in, in, in exodus uh, 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 right what i see in 11 and 12 it says oh so the lord spoke to moses saying when you take the sum of the children of israel i love what you brought in there you said the hebrew literally can mean when you raise up that's so powerful when you take, when you raise up, that's so powerful because you made me see like, you know, you made me see like, um, a, a, like, a, a, like a equipping type of um, thing that kind of entered my soul when you said that. Like when you raise up, oh yeah, don't you know Moses loved Israel so much? He was there. With, listen, Moses was there. He was there when the older ones and the babies and he had a chance to see the babies become the older ones. Like he, yeah, he definitely raised up. It's so powerful when you look at stuff like that, especially when there's so many you know babies out here that are that are um, captured and hostage. You know, oh Lord, just get them out of there. But anyway, so verse twelve it says not anyway. Like I mean, yeah, you know, we need to pray about that hard. And I'm cutting in the middle of this, but you know, the babies, so you know, you gotta pray to just get you know out of that situation. Even the elderly Holocaust, you know, amazing how you brought it up in the Holocaust, how they had they were tattooed with a number. Do you know my name? Right? All through our scriptures, whenever the Lord shows us how precious we are, and I agree with what you're saying, we're, we're so dynamically precious together. Precious to the Lord. You know the powerful thing about us? He sees all of us together as a people. A people, not peoples, right? The multitude, he sees us as a people. People. Sometimes he will literally gravitate us. I think that's why he moves us, you know, into household, tribe, you know, into con convocation where we all come together. Like these things, it moves God when he, when we're all in the, look how many feasts he has. Where we all come together and he addresses us all together and makes it a Shabbat. Tells us to be festive, celebrate, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's almost like he loves to see us all together one and have us know uniquely, individually, how precious we are dynamically, you know, in his sight. So, yeah, he, he takes us up. He raises us up. And then he puts a ransom. Listen, now, what it says in, in my scripture, it says, you know, when I'm reading the English translation, King James here, it says, when you take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall you give every man a ransom. Hear this, a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. That is powerful. So what's the ransom that is determined by God to be adequately redeemed to be as unto the Lord when numbered? The blood of Messiah. So powerful. When we think about his precious blood that redeemed us, that bought us back. Every soul has been purchased by God but we have to embrace the reconciliation by balancing uh, uh, ourselves they call this uh, what do they call it? Recon reconciliation is is literally an accounting term which means to balance the books with God ha! that's so powerful you're bringing this up like it says in Corinthians right okay now I'm a little bit hyper you know some people are like this guy you know he's up I'm not even listening anymore. some people are really hanging with me here right but, but really you gotta hang because you gotta know how precious you are to the Lord. You're so precious that he came in humanity and shed his blood on a tree that was a cursed tree. He bore a curse for us. Innocent, pure, the Lord of glory put on righteousness himself because we could not balance the scales. And yet the Lord, you know, he, he prophesied this even to, uh, to Eve before she was even Eve. She said, you know, your seed is going to crush, bruise, like obliterate the enemy's seed, his head up in here. And the enemy's head was to subtly rob us of the dominion God gave us to be precious. Like mountain peaks of Bashan. Is that right? I, don't, I hope I'm saying it right. I don't want to say something in error. But the Lord has many peaks in his kingdom. We're all like dynamic mountains. Yet he meets us in the valley where we're so broken. In the valley it seems we're, we're broken. And when we make that ascension with him. Somebody said you got to ascend even to come into Jerusalem. To go through the gates you got to ascend. And I wonder what it's like to ascend with the Lord. And enter in. 
That's powerful. You know, it says in Corinthians, what is it, 2 Corinthians 5? Is that right? 2 Corinthians 5. I think that's where it is. 2 Corinthians 5, right? 17? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Is that where it is? I'm pretty sure it is, right? 2 Corinthians 5? Is it 2 Corinthians 5? Yeah. 2 Corinthians 5. Listen to this. This is intense. Look what he says here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Mashiach, be in Christ. Do you remember what the, the Lord of glory, the Father from heaven said when the when Mashiach, when he got baptized by John the Baptist? He's fulfilling the, the ordinances of new covenant to believe, to be baptized. He Even the spirit of the Lord came upon him. These are all God's methods of authenticity when it comes to true belief in new covenant. And the other powerful thing, it's all the Lord doing it. He even uses our brethren or our sisters to engage us on the authentic on the authentic pathway to genuine faith in Mashiach Yeshua, the Lord of Glory, being our Savior, our Redeemer, who shed His blood so precious and ransomed us to be counted in the number, in the number, right? Which is an endless number, which isn't a tattooed number upon us, but a name. You know, the thing about when the Lord, okay, I know I gotta go here. I'm talking a lot, but I'm trying to bring conclusion. The Lord mentioned everyone's name. Remember Moses? He said, Moses, Moses. Remember Abraham? He said, Abraham, Abraham. And right, think about every time the Lord, think of, think of Samuel. He ran to Eli <laughs> seven times. And Eli finally was like, Oh, wait a minute. I think the Lord's calling you. <laughs> wow. Have you ever heard him call your name? Someone's like, no, I've never heard the heavens open, crack open and thunder and call my name. Yeah, but have you ever heard him call your name? When Jesus, when the Yeshua of the Lord invited you into his salvation, he was calling your name. You ever felt it in your heart where you're like, wow, I feel like the Lord is calling me deeper to this covenant reality. He's calling your name. And maybe you didn't hear him say your name precisely. Because I heard that he calls your name and some even get a new name to their name. That's powerful. The Lord has a habit of doing that. You know, giving us new names and stuff. It doesn't mean that your name is gone. Because he even uses the, the name you were given. Your birth name. That's powerful, right? A lot of talking. Trying to be sincere. Coming down. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be a Mashiach, be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Did we not hear Isaiah say such things? Think about the ramifications. So here's a, here's a Lord of glory, Messiah. He's, he's fulfilling the Torah of the old covenant. He's fulfilling the authenticities of the Brit Hadashah, the bloom of the Torah in the new covenant where he's inscribing things on our heart. He's circumcising our heart. He's writing things in our mind when it comes to his blossom of the Torah. And here's the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, getting baptized by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is like, I'm not even worthy to untie your shoes. How can you ask me to do this thing? He's like, no, we have to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. So a true lover of God who truly is under the inspection of the Lord in a sense of, Father, I want I want to love you. See what I'm doing? See what I'm doing? I love you, right? Gets a good understanding of this. And here's the Messiah. He gets baptized. He, he comes out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord descends like a, a dove resting upon him. And the voice comes from heaven. The excellence of glory. The Hashem of God is in the water being baptized, coming up, and here's the the, the, the Yahweh, right? The the Yah, the the, the Hash, Hashem, the the, the continents. Uh, we don't even know how to say his name because we don't have the vowels, and that's what I heard, right? But I mean, here's the Father of Glory who sent His Son for us, and what's He say to all who are standing present, beholding Him getting baptized by John the Baptist in water? Like he needed to. He did it for us. He comes out of the water and we hear the voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So this means anybody who's in Messiah has the same attitude, the same word, the same delegated, the same unique love, a profession from God in heaven, the almighty God has the same profession upon their life as the Messiah took for us when he came out of the water. The Lord God Almighty is saying, 
to all of us who are counted in the number redeemed through the blood of Messiah, even those who have not yet come into faith, who have an opportunity to say yes to the love of God, he's saying, in him, get in him, because in him, the balances are scaled with excellence before his glory. In him, he's well pleased. That's, that's the power of, of, of the profession. So the sincerity aspect, where's the strengthening factor? What's the unique uh, aspect of it? When we consider the, uh, our redemption, how can we not but you know desire to uh, live our life in light to the to the love that the Lord has shown towards us in His unique sacrifice and giving His blood and His life for us makes sense to me. If He gave His blood, He poured out His soul, He travailed, He by His stripes, the excellence of the sacrifice, He did all that for us. How could we not, when the love of God is shed abroad our hearts, want to live a life exemplary to, 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 to fully pour out our lives for Him? And you know the powerful thing about it? In the uniqueness of, of uh, the heart's uh, uh, illumination, we do so by just living the breath we breathe. within our differences that we're all needed, yeah. not yes. within being the same. Yes. Exactly. And when I think of that, I think of the tribes, right? You had all yes. different tribes. God didn't call everyone to be of the same tribe. Yes. And you have the role of the priests and the Levites and the, were any of them better than the other and the prophets? No, they just all had their own role. Yes. And I think of the incense in the temple that was Lashem, a pleasant smell to God. And when you take those incense apart, there were 10 incense, some of them smelled really bad wow. and but when they were together they were the pleasant smell to God Israel arrives like the wind that drips from the blue.